Hello? Hello. Who are you? Me? Oh, I'm Simon Wells. Who are you? Uh, pass. Well, I tell you what, I think you're Bruce Fielding. I've heard that name. Have you? Yes, several times. Oh. It must be me. I think you're Bruce Fielding, voiceover artist extraordinaire and co-host of the ever-popular weekly podcast, Factorally. Factorally? I've heard of that. You have? Is it any good? I've been told it's all right. Well, I might listen in then. <laughs> so Simon Wells, voiceover. What are, we, what are we talking about this week? Well, this week, as with every week, we pick a, a, a random subject that you wouldn't really think would have an awful lot of material in it. And then pages and pages of notes later, it turns out it's actually quite interesting. Yes. Um, and this appears to have been another one of those. This week we are talking about bottles. Bottles. Not the sort of, not, not the kind of thing that you lose. No, you don't want, don't want to lose your bottle. No, no. no. The sort of thing you, you drink out of or keep stuff in. Yes. Okay, let's start there. Okay, then let's start there. <laughs> um, the, the definition of a bottle is a glass or plastic container with a narrow neck used for storing drinks or other liquids. Ah, they're not always glass, though, are they? Because the, uh, the Mesopotamians um, didn't use bottles made of glass or plastic, did they? Although, you know, Mesopotamian plastic is obviously very rare. Very rare indeed, I should think, yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> they would use things like uh, gourds or, or the skins of animals to keep liquids in. But they, would they be bottles as such? Hard to say, isn't it? Whether they would have given it a, a particular name. So um, to go down an etymological route, as often we do, uh, the word bottle has a bit of a journey. Uh, the, the word bottle comes from French boite. Uh, boite comes from the old French botte. Botte comes from the Latin buttius. Um, and the Latin buttius means a, a cask or a flask. Like a butt. Like a butt of mamsie. Or a butt. A water butt. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's assume it's there's a connection the same, there. all the same root as, as, as a bottle. Yeah. Interesting. It all, it all comes back to the butt. But actually, they did used to be um, glass bottles very, very long time ago. How long ago? 1 BC. That's why my, my, my research has told me that it's about 1 BC. That, That's um, quite a long time ago. That is quite a long time ago. And to, it, originally what they did was they would sort of like make a, a clay model hmm. of a jar or something or a bottle. Hmm. And then they would surround this with um, sand or the, the, the silica, the, the yeah. material that glass is made from. Yeah. And then build a fire over it so that the that melted. Oh, I see. And then, and then chip away all the... Um, the, the clay that had um, that it had been moulded around. Oh, I see. Okay, clever. But but then the blowpipe was invented. The blowpipe was invented uh, around sort of one BC, and um, this allowed molten glass to be gathered on the end of the pipe and then blown into uh, a hollow vessel. I mean, and right. that was done as long ago as that. That was done, yeah, two thousand years ago. Gosh, long, long time ago. <laughs> So this will be interesting. You and I go away with the subject title and nothing else. We do our own research. We come back. Sometimes we've accidentally researched the same things. Sometimes we've researched completely different things. So it'll be interesting to see which ones I've picked up on and which ones you've picked up on. Well, yes. Given, given the nature of our drinking habits, <laughs> I, I, I would expect you to be beer bottle. Interesting. And I would expect me to be wine bottle. Right. Okay. Okay. One of the things I did do a bit of research on was champagne bottles, unless you've done some research on champagne bottles. Well, I haven't done research on champagne bottles per se, hmm. but I have done some research on the various different bits of a bottle. Ooh, OK. Well, let's start there. So well, let's start at the top with the orifice or throat or bore, which is basically the hole at the top of the bottle. Would never have thought it had so many names. Yes, it's 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 called all sorts of things. Hmm. Then you've got the bit just below the hole, to which goes from the hole to the collar, which is there's normally a collar around, yes. just there, and that's called the lip or the finish. Right. Then there's the neck of the bottle, which is the bit below the collar. Okay. And then you've got a shoulder, uh, which looks like somebody's droopy shoulder. Yes. Yes, you're describing this very well. I can picture it. And then, and then you've got the main body mm -hmm. of the of the, of the bottle. Yeah. And then you have the most interesting bit, 
which is the in-sweep or heel. I mean, it's also called lots and lots of other things as well. Hmm. See, I would just call that the bottom. Would I be frowned upon in certain, <laughs> certain well, circles? <laughs> it is the bottom, but it's also called, it's got a name which sort of we, we currently associate with sort of bras. So where the bottom is, mm-hmm. there's actually a bit which is called the, the push-up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that the, the, so the, the sort that, of the dimply bit that exactly. goes up, it's back up kick, into the bottom? It's called the kick-up or push-up. Is it? And um, so that's, that's, so you've got the heel or the in-sweep. Mm. And mm. then, so, so the heel is, and the reason that that um, kick up or push up is is there. Mm. It, there's there are a couple of reasons for that. that. There's there's the nice reason, which is <laughs> that it gives you a nice. You can put the bottle on a, any kind of surface, and it's l- more likely to be level and therefore not to fall over. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. The uh, the second reason is that um, sediment gets sort of caught around the edge of that kick ah. up so that the, the wine remains pure and there's like a little circle of, of sediment at the bottom. Yes. And then there's the pragmatic one, which is that if you have a, a very large kick up in a bottle, then you don't mm. have to put quite so much liquid in it for it and it'll still look like you've got quite a big <laughs> bottle. <laughs> there's also, also the serving reason, which is that um, a, a well-trained up. waiter can put his thumb in or her thumb into the kick up and pour the bottle one-handedly yes that looks very suave it does doesn't it very <laughs> suave well i'm learning things already i never knew there were yes, so many parts to a bottle um oh i've just remembered something that i haven't researched but i've remembered how to do it so have you ever seen any talking of champagne bottles have you ever seen anybody use a saber to open a champagne bottle i have yes they sort of lay the saber flat against the bottle and swipe upwards towards the orifice as i now know it's called yes knocking the cork out of the end well actually that's not what happens shame (laughs) (laughs) so if you look at a bottle generally speaking now they they have a seam if you look at the glass there's a there's a seam on the glass because then they're they're actually molded bottles rather than blown ah so the in the molding there's all sorts of um, information on the bottle within the, the molding of the glass. Yeah. But one of the key things is that there's actually a seam goes up the, up the side of the glass. Oh. When you take the sabre to the bottle of champagne, hmm. and listeners may find this useful for the future, so get your, take your, for number one, take your sabre and slide... Actually, num- number one, listen to the episode on tools that distinguishes <laughs> the difference between a sword, a sabre and a rapier. Yes, and, and an epe. And an epe. And, and um, so, yeah, so you slide, slide the sabre up the seam quite quickly mm. uh, towards the collar. Mm. And then as the sabre hits the collar, not only does the cork come out, but the entire top of the bottle oh, comes off. Does it? Very neatly in huh. a nice circle. So, and, and you don't get any like broken glass in the bottle. Because the ex- the expelling of the champagne inside yeah. pushes any broken glass gotcha. out of the way. But if you look at a bottle that's been opened with a sabre, you will see that the whole of the top's gone. Right. That's a good fact. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, my fact about champagne bottles... Essentially, it, it comes down to the fact that the, the champagne bottle as we know it was invented in England. Sorry, France. Um, Sparkling wine has been around since medieval times, but it was originally seen as a flaw to have bubbles in your wine. The the wine had been left in in the cold cellar for too long. It's gone off. It's gone off, yeah. The fermentation process has continued. It's got bubbles in it. No one wants that. Um, The the bubbles uh, would would break the, the glass bottles, which back then were thinner and not as sturdy as they are now so it was a problem and over the years people sort of started quite liking this these bubbles you know the bottles that did survive were were quite rare and therefore the rich took them on and and said oh look at this i've got this sparkling wine how exciting but the bottles were never strong enough to be mass produced and and used for that intention in 1615 james the first um who was warring with some country or other (laughs) <laughs> I can't remember which one. Might be France, might be Spain. We alternate. Um, was this he, James the First who was James the Sixth? 
That's the one, James the First of so England. The one country that it wouldn't have been is Scotland. Scotland, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the unless they were having Scots. an off day. <laughs> yes. So uh, James the First or the Sixth, depending on which way you look at it, he was at war. He uh, was making lots of ships for his navy. He made it law that no oak trees could be felled in this country for any purpose other than making ships for his navy. Uh, the, the bottle manufacturers, glass manufacturers, had always used charcoal for their furnaces, which is obviously made out of, of wood. So they had to suddenly switch to coal because they weren't allowed to, allowed to use wood for that purpose anymore. Their coal furnaces burned at a higher temperature. Higher temperature in making glass makes tougher, stronger glass. That makes sense. Yeah. And so it was only as a result of that that the, the, the glass used in wine bottles could be made thicker, stronger, tougher, and withstand the pressure of the, the, of the fizz. So uh, it, it's kind of down to that random law about, navy, about the Navy that, that ended up with um, bottles that could take on the job. Wow. Um, apparently the pressure inside a champagne bottle is up to three times the pressure of a car tyre, which is more than I would have thought. Yeah, was that about um, sort of 70, 80 PSI or something? Quite something like that. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, officially written down that the, the process of making um, sparkling wine uh, was first documented in 1662, so sort of 50 odd years after the whole wood charcoal thing, uh, by an English physician called Christopher Merritt. And he first documented the process of, of how to make sparkling wine which was a full 35 years before some French dude called Dom Perignon invented champagne. Yes, there's all sorts of weird things to do with champagne, isn't there? Like, like sort of, if, 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 you're, if you want to be very poncy, you talk about, I'll have a bottle of the Widow, please. The Widow? Yes, the Widow Clicquot. Ah, apparently we've been, um, we've been pronouncing Moet and Chandon wrong for all these years. Have we? Yeah. We, we're pronouncing moe as if it were a French word. It isn't. Yeah. It's Dutch. It's moet. And they would pronounce it moet. So the Queen lyrics, she keeps a moe and chandon in a pretty cabinet. No, she doesn't. No, she keeps the moet and, yeah. and chandon. Yeah. There we go. It's a bit like that Lothario, isn't it? Uh, Don, Don, Don Juan. Oh, yes. Don Juan, right. Don Juan, who's actually, whose name is actually should be pronounced Don Juan. Oh, is that right? So Don Ju if, if you look at the poem, Don Juan wor works because it rhymes with stuff, other stuff in the poem, whereas Don Juan doesn't. Oh, how interesting. Appa apparently we pronounce um, Mount Everest wrong. Do we? The chap who named that mountain pronounced his surname Everest. Ah. Yeah. Everest. Everest. Mount Everest. So basically we pronounce most stuff wrong because we're we British do. and we don't We're care. English, we're lazy, we, we can't be bothered. Yeah. So anyway... So bottles. Oh yes, bottles. Is it all boot uh, bottles? <laughs> <laughs> yes, bottles. Bottles. <laughs> um, so, so they've been they've been around for a while, um, yes. and we just talked about opening a bottle, but yes. closing a bottle has been sort of quite interesting as well, hasn't it? So they they started off by closing them with just wax, mm -hmm. just getting some wax out, and then yep. and then someone worked out that actually you could you could, you could shove a cork in it, mm -hmm. as my friends often tell me to do <laughs> <laughs> um uh, but then now nowadays we have the the um screw top yes we do and apparently there's a bit of snobbery about corks versus screw tops but screw tops are technically better for the wine than corks really yes how so uh because the cork adds another chem chemical element to oh. the liquid inside obviously Okay. Whereas a screw top doesn't. The screw top is usually it's sort of like coated in the inside's coated with plastic, so that it doesn't actually interact with the, um, the the liquid inside at all. How interesting! Yes, I, I would automatically think of a a corked bottle as being higher quality than a, a or, you know at least at well, least gen higher price. Generally, they're more expensive, and generally yeah. they're, they're still kind of like there's the very great snobbery about oh, yeah. yes, you know, like the, the the wine waiter will come over to your table and. Flamboyantly, uh, with and with great deal of performance, will remove the bo the cork from the bottle. Yes, and then hand you the corkscrew with the cork still attached to the corkscrew, yes. so that you could sniff it. Yes, and see whether the wine is corked or not. Yes. Uh, 
a lot of wine comes in um, coloured glass bottles. That's true, yes. Usually green, isn't it? Usually green or brown. Yeah. Why is that? Well, that's because of ultraviolet light. Of course. Because light getting through into the wine Hmm. is not good for the wine. So what you want is something that's going to chop out the UV so that the wine stays stable and isn't affected by by light. I see. So you know what a wine bottle looks like. Hmm. Then there are larger bottles of champagne oh, yes. and wine. Yes. So you get a, ma- a magnum, which is uh, a chap who lives in Hawaii and solves crimes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, two, or two bottles of wine. Right. And then you get a, a Jeroboam, okay. which is four bottles of wine. Ooh. Then you get the one that racing drivers like, which the one that they shake on the podium. And that's uh. a Methuselah. That's eight bottles of wine. As if the biblical character Methuselah is twice as big as the biblical character Jeroboam. Well, quite. Well, then you get to uh, Salmanazar, which is 10 bottles. Right. And Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, my goodness. Who's 20 bottles. Solomon. That's 24 bottles. Champagne, mostly. A sovereign, which is 35 bottles. And that's the biggest you can get, a sovereign of wine. Wow. But I don't think anybody could actually pick up a sovereign of wine. You'd have to have it delivered on a truck. <laughs> the shape of some bottles is mm. just so iconic, it's ridiculous. And one yes. of the, you know, there's the, one of, one, there is one bottle that is the best known shape in the whole world. You know what it is. I'm going to take a wild stab in the dark at uh, Coca Cola. Correct. It is ever so iconic, isn't it? Without it, just a pure silhouette of the outline of that bottle, you know exactly what you're about to drink. Yes. What do you know of the history of the Coca-Cola bottle? Nothing. Brilliant. Just as well, that's one of the areas that I researched. Is it? <laughs> it is. Brilliant. See, we said at the beginning that we don't know what each what each other's researched. Some, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. I know. So, <laughs> Simon, I'm now sitting comfortably. Tell me all about the Coca-Cola bottle. Then I'll begin. Once upon a... No. Um, So when Coca-Cola was first produced, it was a a fountain drink. So there would be sellers, shops, uh, who had, you know, large containers of Coca-Cola and decanted it into a a smaller container for you or just served you a a cup full as you went to the store. Um, It was not until the 1890s, which actually is still, you know, quite a long time ago. Yes. um, A couple of lawyers from Chattanooga which I can't hear without thinking of the (laughs) choo-choo. These two uh, lawyers, Joseph Whitehead and Benjamin Thomas, Ah. came up with this uh, idea of of bottling Coca-Cola in just a very simple, straight, ordinary-looking bottle. And um, they managed to get the right to bottle Coca-Cola. And they set up all these other branches, all these other bottling plants around America um, that started bottling Coca-Cola in 1899. And it remained a fairly boring straight bottle for a handful of years. It wasn't until 1916 that the predecessor of what we would know now, it looks very similar, it's not quite the same, but that sort of curved hourglass looking shape uh, was invented in, in 1916. And that's pretty much what it's been served in ever since. Um, by, the, by the year 1920, there were over 1,200 Coca-Cola bottling plants around the the United States. Wow. Um, They make quite a few bottles. In 2016, um, Coca-Cola produced over 110 billion bottles of Coca-Cola in that year alone. Billion with a B. Wow. So we've covered wine and champagne bottles. We've covered soft drink bottles. Uh, Something else I looked at was um, feeding bottles. Oh, right, for babies. Yeah. Um, Baby feeding bottles go back way longer than I would ever have expected. Uh, In in one form or another, they have existed since at least the Roman era, if not before. There have been clay bottles discovered in in ancient burial grounds next to the remains of of an infant. Um, In the Roman era, they they were already writing about the fact that they were worried that these bottles were not sufficiently hygienic. Um, and another method ought to be come up with. So they're, they're really old, uh, apparently. Um, in the 1700s, they were made out of metal uh, of various types. 
before that they have been made out of um, perforated cow horns and, and you know the baby would just suckle on the end of the the cow horn wow. with a few ho- holes punched in it in 1770 there was a, a fellow called hugh smith who patented the bubby pot <laughs> which i think is a wonderful <laughs> name the bubby pot the bubby pot was um, he english or american he was english he was oh, okay. uh, stu- he he worked at the um, middlesex hospital in london not in middlesex obviously um and he created this thing it sort of looked a bit like a coffee pot but with an extended spout that you could just sort of pour milk <laughs> directly into the the child's mouth um and then they sort of got refined slightly the the idea of having a little teat of some form yes. on the end that the, that the baby could actually suck came along and even those have gone through quite a few different permutations they were made out of um lots of different materials they were the sort of that you had a, a rag just stuffed in the end of a bottle and the baby would suck on the rag osmosis um, that makes sense doesn't it yeah doesn't it, yeah. it in a sense although wouldn't does, all yeah. the goodness get sucked out of the the milk by the rag you just well probably you, you, you'd probably end up sucking some very disgusting tasting milk yes. i should think um then teats were made out of cork with bits of leather strapped around them in the 1800s that was a a, a thing that went on um It wasn't until 1845 that Indian rubber was first used to make something that would look, you know, quite similar to a modern day bottle teat that that we would know now. But Indian rubber tastes disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) So they weren't popular. Uh, And and so it wasn't until the 20th century that they they sort of started making these things out of PVC and, you know, other tasteless, bland materials that are easily produced and um, have, have become the staple that they are now. But according to, I didn't know this existed, the global baby bottle market. <laughs> Hi, I work for the, gla- the global baby <laughs> bottle. That's hard to say. We should use that as one of our warm-ups in, in our voiceover. The global, global baby, baby bottle, bottle market. market. Global baby bottle market. Yes. That works. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in 2022, so just last year, the global baby bottle market was estimated. Very good. I'm impressed. Thank you. I've been practicing. <laughs> uh, was um, was valued at around 3.46 billion US dollars. So Crikey. there's a lot of money being spent on baby bottles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the last bottles, they shoot them in, in westerns, don't they? they? They line them up on a wall and shoot them. Yeah, they use them for target practice, don't they? But yeah. but the ones that they hit you over the head with in, in movies are Ooh. not glass. Come again. So the so they're sugar. So the glass bottles, that, that, that if, you're, if you're involved in a bar fight in a western and somebody hits you over the head with a beer <laughs> bottle or a, or a whiskey bottle, the likelihood is that it's made of sugar. Really? Yes. It's... It, it's it, and it, they break very easily. I mean, even when you're bringing the bottle down on someone's head, you have to watch out that um, the neck doesn't <laughs> doesn't come apart from the main body of the bottle. It's, it's, right. they're, they're very delicate. Huh. And, and then presumably the, the, the unmistakable sound of shattering glass is added on post-production. Foley, yes, absolutely. Put, huh. put on at the end. I guess that makes sense. Some of those Some of those Westerns did involve an awful lot of being smacked over the head with a bottle. Yes. You could have an injury. Yes, going through glass windows and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So presumably there are companies who just make sugar bottles. There are. Huh. And yes, uh, f- purely for um, theatre, yeah. um, film. All th- I mean, if you if you go to a play and somebody gets hit by a bottle, mm. it, unless it's the audience throwing the bottles, of course, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's generally made of sugar. Were there any other types of bottles into which you researched, Bruce? There weren't, although I know there are lots more. Uh, okay. and, and how about you, Simon? I went on a little trip down hot water bottles uh-huh. that didn't last terribly long. I have I have several different shapes of hot water bottle. Do you? Yes. In fact, I, ha- and I also have a cold water bottle. I have an ice pack uh, water bottle. Ah, okay. So I have a, the, the ice pack one is a circular water bottle, which mm-hmm. I shall go and get you in a minute and show you. Thank you. Um, but it looks like you know in the in, in old nineteen thirties uh, films where someone gets uh, a black eye, yes, and they put something on their face to kind of yes. get get rid of the bruise and sort of that, that puckered up leather pouch with well, a, a well, there's that, but the, this this is a, a blue. It's made by Thermos, I think. It's it's yeah. a it's like a circular blue hot water bottle, right? Like okay. Flat, 
and you fill it up with ice water and you can put it on your head and, and, and okay. bring down swelling. Hmm. But I also have a, a long, thin water bottle. I'm not exactly sure what the long, thin one is for. I've never really used it. But I, and I also have one, one inside a, have one inside a teddy bear. Yes, okay. <laughs> Lovely. Charming. What a lovely image. <laughs> <laughs> well, the teddy bear is actually uh, exactly the same as my dog. <laughs> so it's, it's, te te it's technically in inside, inside a bearded collie. Brilliant. But, there uh, can't be terribly many of those around. <laughs> no, I don't know why I've got so many hot water bottles, really, because I don't use them that much. Well, some people collect stamps. Some people collect bottles. <laughs> I have one very standard hot water bottle in inside a spotty orange fluffy uh, case. Um, please, listeners, tell us your hot water <laughs> bottle preferences in the comments. Yes, please do. And and pictures, ideally. Oh, yeah, pictures. Why not? Yes, do it. Um, so that's, that's modern hot water bottles. The predecessors of hot water bottles have been around since at least the 16th century. Um, people would have either clay, uh, ceramic containers yes, or metal. Yes, they were ceramic, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or metal later on, um, just filled with um, coals, leftover coals from the day's fire. Uh, and, and these bed warmers were inserted into the bed. They were taken out before you went to bed so that you didn't hurt yourself because they were yeah. quite warm. But they were there just to, to warm the bed before you, you got in. Eventually the, the coals were replaced with hot water, which meant they weren't so hot so they could stay in bed with you overnight and, and maintain that, that heat metal ones existed glass ones existed and then eventually to prevent burning they became wrapped up in soft fluffy material as they are now because bottles weren't cheap to produce so they were they were used to hold expensive things inside them hmm. and one of the things that was very expensive was perfume Oh, of course, yeah. And if you think about, it, I mean, a lot, so much creativity goes into the creation of of a perfume bottle. Mm. If you look, if if you go into the perfume department of a department store, the just the techniques and the and and the style of it, yeah. where and and that's always been the case. I mean, even even like sort of a thousand BC, the Egyptians used amazing, cl clever glass, almost exclusively for perfume. Really, as far back as the Egyptians. Wow. Yeah, I know. Um, it, it's crazy. The, uh, the Romans, um, who don't really, they thought perfumes were aphrodisiacs, so they kept them sort of quite subtly. <laughs> and they used uh, they they used blown glass and molded glass bottles right. for um, for for perfume. But huh. then, um, sort of about twelve twelve hundred years later, and then twelfth century, there was a statute in France uh, forming the the Guild of Parfumeurs. Then. So the Venetians started to to make very ornate glass. I mean, right. Ven Venetian glass is still highly yeah, of course, prized. Yes. Um, and then it sort of started that the scent bottle started, was made in gold and silver, huh. um, and copper and glass and porcelain and enamel, all sorts of different things. And they were shaped in different like like animals. They were shaped like cats and oh, birds and interesting. But then then in the nineteen twenties you get people like Rene Lalique, mm. who was a famous uh, French jeweller mm. uh, who revived the interest in, in bottles with molded glass, which were just amazing looking things. So so perfume actually led to a lot of um creativity in, in bottles. Yes. As it as it still is now. Yes. If you see a bottle of perfume mm. that's shaped like a sailor do you know who makes that perfume? Oh, with the with the the, the stripy, the horizontal stripy T-shirt. I can picture that. Um, I'll give you a clue. His initials are JPG. Jean Paul Gaultier. Yes, I think actually some of the perfume, of, although some of it comes in sort of bottles that look like very hench kind of sailors. <laughs> For the female per, um, fragrances, they look very much like sort of bondage wear or <laughs> very strange sort of sexually arresting shapes. Interesting. But they've they've all got this hourglass shape. Yes. Yeah. So you can tell a Jean-Paul Gaultier fragrance from a distance. Huh. Not to be confused with a Coca-Cola bottle. Yes. <laughs> exactly. The hourglass thing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try and drink the Jean-Paul Gaultier fragrances, though. No. No. Well, Simon, that's that. That's all I know about bottles. What about you? Is that, have, we come, have we come to the to the neck of our, or are we just down to the dregs? <laughs> yes, I think we've we've got ourselves down to the the kick up of 
of this topic. It's um, more than I ever thought we could rabbit on about, about bottles. I'm, I'm quite impressed. I know. Well, maybe we should um, put a cork in it. Yes. <laughs> and say thank you to everybody who's been listening to us yes. for this episode. We, really, we do appreciate you listening to us. And actually, we just love whispering on to each other. We would still do this without you, frankly. Yeah. But it would be a much lonelier existence. We are much happier to share this ridiculous <laughs> show with people who like to listen to it. Absolutely. So thank you all for being those people. We appreciate your, your ears. So please come again next week for another exciting episode of Factorally. Factorally. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye now.